Hello everyone, happy Thursday, and welcome to another week and another episode and a brand new year here at Quandaries and Sundries. I hope you all had a great holidays and a great new year, so let's just hop right into today's stories. Let's start off talking about natural disasters. Because of the next few years to the next few coming decades, it will become worse and worse and more prevalent. And what just happened over the holidays in Colorado has given us a huge wake-up call that natural disasters can happen anywhere. So I thought, why not look at some preventative measures I have found recently? Let's talk about drought, which has become a major problem in the last few years, especially in the southwestern United States. As the two biggest reservoirs in the United States, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, which 40 million Americans rely on every year for water, have dropped to about a third of their capacity. California, Utah, and Arizona have had to to put drastic water restrictions in place to conserve water. But what people aren't talking about is the agricultural industry. California is one of the most important states for the nation's agricultural production with a total of 43 million acres dedicated to growing food. But recently, drought policy changes threatened to shut down at least 800,000 acres of that food production. California, as a state alone, is responsible for 90% of the nation's almonds, artichokes, avocados, broccoli, cauliflower, celery, dates, figs, grapes, strawberries, lemons, lettuce, plums, and walnuts. And as drought gets worse and worse, I believe that a simple change in our diets and what we could grow could help us in the long run and stop food shortages from becoming a problem. So let's take a lesson and take a trip back in time to the Mayan Empire in the 9th century AD, where major drought hit Central America and Mayan cities began to lose its citizens to starvation. But not all of them died. Because of the 500 different crops and plants the mines were known to use, at least a few dozen of them were drought-resistant and were the reason that the culture did not completely go extinct. And while their diets were different from ours, we can actually take another page from their book and look at other common plants we use on a regular basis that are actually drought-resistant. And maybe as drought worsens, we can rebuild our food industries around them Plenty of food are drought resistant, such as rhubarb, Swiss chard, sweet potatoes, I love my sweet potatoes, eggplants, mustard greens, okra, and various peppers. Even asparagus is drought resistant, depending on the strain, aka depending on the breed. I love asparagus. I'm glad that's not leaving. If you're a fan of legumes, then chickpeas, lima beans, and black-eyed peas are also drought-resistant. We can even take a page from our International Brethren's books. Traveling to the Middle East, and you'll see in many markets you can find Armenian cucumbers and Jerusalem artichokes, which thrive in hot, hot, arid climates. I know rehauling our entire diets and our entire agricultural system is a giant feat, But for us to survive as a species, I think we can make some subtle changes and try these foods out, especially as droughts get worse. And hey, if you eat heart of palm, enjoy it because it's one of the foods Mayans ate in times of droughts. So maybe plant-based diets centered around drought-resistant foods isn't such a bad idea in the next few coming decades. But first, before I get back into your regularly scheduled content, if you enjoy my content, and if you're listening on YouTube, I'd really appreciate if you give this video a like, a comment, and if you're new to my content, consider subscribing. And do not forget to hit that little bell icon so you can be notified whenever I post something new. Or if you're listening to this on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever audio platform you're listening to this on, please consider giving me a follow. Any feedback is greatly appreciated. Now let's get right into the rest of the episode. I thought I'd end on a topic I'm really passionate about that will kind of be a little bit ranty. I know you love me when I'm ranty. A topic that makes me so happy, happy, especially as a 90s kid. So let's talk if Pluto 
is actually a planet because apparently scientists are reconsidering its planet status. Until 2006, when I was about 13, astronomers and scientists alike decided that Pluto was not a planet anymore because it did not meet the three criteria to be a planet, which are as follows. One, it must orbit a star. It has that covered. Two, it must be big enough to have enough gravity to force it into a spherical shape. It's spherical! So that's check. Actually, extra points if anyone gets that reference. 90s kids will definitely get that reference. And finally, number three. It must be big enough that its gravity cleared away any other objects of a similar size near its orbit around the sun. And sadly, it doesn't meet that final criteria. As our understanding of our solar system grew, we discovered m many different celestial bodies the size of Pluto at the edge of our solar system, or beyond Neptune as some call it, that we couldn't call planets, so reclassification was necessary. Over a dozen different bodies have become discovered and have been known as Plutineos, also known as trans-Neptunian objects. But the question is, who decided what is and isn't a planet? Well, that honor goes to the International Astronomy Union, a non-government agency with the express purpose to promote astronomical research and help educate, and is also in charge of naming and classifying planets. The push to reclassify Pluto comes from many experts who think that the decision to neuter, neuter Pluto of its planet status came from a revisionist perspective that goes against science and that we should go by the definition that was set in the 16th century which says that a planet is any geological body in space and while that also includes moons as well I do think that it should be reclassified even if we have discovered more and more celestial bodies in our solar system Pluto is by far the largest of the Plutinos we have discovered. Also, at the end of the day, a dwarf planet is still a planet. And I know teaching 20 more planets will be challenging. But as we discover more and expand outside our universe, I think we need to break from what's traditional a little and learn about every planet out there and give them their time to shine. I mean, the name Mars has been beaten to death, but have you heard of the planet Eris or the planet Ceres? Yes, those planets reside in our solar system near Pluto. Now I want to touch on the so-called revisionist history hot take. Especially as an American in the last 20 to 25 years, history has been revised as we look at different historical events throughout our nation's history. And depending on the state, it's controversial. But I think when it comes to outer space, I think it's a whole nother story. Should we change our views as we discover more? Yes, but we shouldn't change our education of the solar system. I believe that Pluto should never have been declassified. And instead, we should have been slowly adding the various dwarf planets to the curriculums of educational systems around the world. There is nothing wrong with 20 planets. The difference between rewriting American history and the cosmos is that while political views on Earth change as society changes, in the great expanse of the cosmos, we are expanding and evolving our horizons every day. And if you don't want to consider Pluto a planet, then at the least, let's teach all the dwarf planets as a subclassification of planets and include them on the solar system model especially those we give to kids. You never know if that one kid who got a solar system model becomes fascinated with Ceres and becomes an astronaut and makes it their life goal to step foot on it and in turn drive civilization forward by helping us land on Ceres. I know that was a long rant, but I am very opinionated on education in our solar system. So I think this is a very important topic we need to cover and reconsider, especially when it comes to educating kids as we expand into our universe. Well, that is all I got for today. For the lack of an episode yesterday due to me being under the weather, 
There will be an episode tomorrow, so don't worry. I got you covered, so look forward to that. On a quick side note, if you ever wonder why there is not an episode, always check my social media because I will always give updates on the show and what will be happening that day. I would like to thank you again for listening. I would love to know what you think and how I can improve the show. After all, I do this all for you. So head over to my social media or just the comments if you're watching the YouTube version and let me know. Thanks so much, and do not forget to share this to all those or anyone in your life who could use a scientific moment in theirs. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow for another episode of Quandaries and Sundries. This is Van Masterson, signing off. Till next time.